Welcome to our hybrid uh, talk. This is the annual Rollo E. Dyer Lecture, which is part of the Wednesday afternoon lecture series at the NIH. And I'm Michael Gottesman, Deputy Director for Intramural Research here at the NIH. I'm really excited to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Nemanje Bumpus, who will be talking to us about personalized HIV treatment. But first, I have a few announcements. Welcome to all those joining us live from Lipset Amphitheater at the NIH Clinical Center. This is a hybrid event, as I noted, in which we have a safely spaced crowd, all masked, here at Lipset. Uh, but the majority of you are watching by NIH videocast. This is the second week in a row that we can come to you live from Lipset, and it's the third hybrid walls this year. And I certainly hope this trend continues. Today is the annual Rollo E. Dyer Lecture. Who is Rollo Dyer? Uh, this is the oldest continuing lecture service at the NIH, established in 1950 to honor Dr. Dyer, a former NIH director and a noted authority on infectious diseases. This lectureship features internationally know, uh, renowned researchers who have contributed substantially to medical as well as biological knowledge of infectious diseases. And that is just the type of expertise we have with today's Dyer lecturer, Naman J. Bumpus. Dr. Bumpus is director of the Department of Pharmacology and Molecular Sciences and a professor of pharmacology and molecular sciences at Johns Hopkins Medicine in Baltimore. Her lab focuses on defining a role for cytochrome P450 dependent metabolites in drug induced acute liver failure with certain antiviral drugs used to treat HIV and hepatitis C. Dr. Bumpus received her undergraduate degree in biology from Occidental College in LA, followed by a PhD in pharmacology from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, under the mentorship of Paul Hollenberg. She then spent the next two years as a postdoctoral fellow at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla in the laboratory of Eric Johnson. And in 2010, she moved to Hopkins uh, School of Medicine in Baltimore as an assistant professor, moved up the ranks, um, and is now the E.K. Marshall and Thomas H. Marin Professor of Pharmacology. Her research interests include antiviral drug-induced toxicity, targeted metabolomics, small molecule mass spectrometry, drug metabolism and preclinical drug development, and modulation of cellular signaling pathways by reactive metabolites. Dr. Bumpus additionally serves on the Council of the American Society for Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics, or ASPET. She previously served as chair of the NIH Xenobiotic and Nutrient Disposition and Action Study section and as an associate editor of Drug Metabolism and Disposition. Dr. Bumpus has earned numerous accolades and honors during her career. These include the Drug Metabolism Early Career Achievement Award from ASPET, the Leon Goldberg Young Investigator Award from the American Society for Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, and a President's Early Career Award for Science and Engineering, or PKs, bestowed by President Obama. Last year, she was featured by Microsoft as one of 30 African-American change makers of the 21st century in the Microsoft Legacy Project, an online virtual museum. The title of Dr. Bumpus's talk today is Toward Personalization of HIV Treatment and Prevention. Dr. Bumpus, we are delighted to have you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really delighted to be here. So um, today I'll talk about really what is mechanistic work, trying to understand the pharmacology of HIV drugs, specifically how they're processed in the body, and how we can leverage that information to start to be more precise and even personalized in antiretroviral therapy. So a lot of what I'll talk to you about is aspirational, but I hope that I'll make a strong case for where I think we can go with this. We have a central focus, as you'll see, on drug metabolism, which is really the transformation of drugs. But I'll say um, social justice is central to me and also really central to the identity of my lab. So we focused on HIV specifically because we think that it's a way for our science to really impact our local community of Baltimore and um, Washington, D.C., where I live. So we really look at science through a drug metabolism lens, or at least pharmacology. And so this is the process by which a majority of drugs that we take, so a majority of medicines are cleared from the body. So essentially, drugs are lipophilic in nature to favor absorption. So you swallow a drug, 
It will go um, through your gut into the liver, and the liver is where we have an abundance of proteins that we call drug metabolizing enzymes that change the drug into something more hydrophilic or water soluble that can be excreted from the body. So these products are called drug metabolites. What's important about this process is that it really controls then how much of that drug that you swallowed ends up in your bloodstream. For some drugs, they are 99% metabolized. So that means that when you take a medicine, if what's active is the actual parent, the actual drug that you took itself and not the metabolites, if 99% of it's metabolized, that means only 1% is really available to then do its thing and circulate in your body and get to its target. So understanding metabolism is really crucial from that perspective. It turns out also that in certain instances, these metabolites can be toxic. And much of drug-induced liver toxicity really is un under underlied by this toxicity induced by metabolites. So we also understand this pathway from that perspective, and I'll talk about some of that work we've done. But as you can imagine then, inter-individual variability in drug metabolism, genetic differences, differences with aging, for instance, sexual dimorphisms, can really then play a role in why one person might respond to a drug differently than another. So this is really at the crux of what we try to get at through our work. So just what this can look like in a little more detail. So the liver is comprised of you know, many cells. So the primary cell of the liver is a hepatocyte. So here I'm showing a hepatocyte. And so in the hepatocyte, as I mentioned, we have drug metabolizing enzymes. So in the second part of the talk, I'll talk about the cytochromes P450, which are proteins, heme-containing proteins, that essentially add an oxygen to a drug. So if you have a drug that goes across through the liver, through the bloodstream, it then can come into a hepatocyte, either via a transporter or even through diffusion. It can then be acted on by drug metabolizing enzymes that change it to what we call a metabolite, and that metabolite can then go back into, back into your bloodstream. It can either be excreted from the body or it might have its own pharmacological activity. So central to what we're trying to ask in the lab, what is the detailed process of metabolism of HIV drugs and how can understanding that help us better predict outcomes? So the first study that I'll talk to you about is really where we're looking at a little bit of non-traditional drug metabolism. So just a little bit of background on why we have um, the specific interest uh, of the first project I'll talk to you about. So as you know, HIV AIDS is a global um, pandemic. And since the beginning, about 70 million people have been infected with HIV. About half of those people have died, so there are about 35 million people worldwide living with HIV, about 1.2 million in the United States. We certainly have a lot of understanding now of transmission of HIV, and we even have interventions to prevent HIV infection. However, even with that, we still have over a million new cases worldwide each year and 40,000 or so in the United States. So it means that in addition to behavioral interventions, it's really important to have a menu of options available, including pharmacological interventions. So this has really been one of our focuses. So one of these methods to prevent HIV infect infection is called HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. So this is essentially the administration of an antiretroviral drug to someone who is HIV negative to prevent them from becoming infected. So currently, as far as oral regimens, the oral regimens that are approved by the FDA are composed of um, two drugs, or pro-drugs for two drugs, tenofovir and emtricitabine. These drugs are advantageous because they have long half-lives, so you can take them once daily because they can hang around and be active in your body for a while. They're given orally, and also there have been interests in formulating them as topical administrations, and here are the structures of each of them, tenofovir and emtricitabine. So these are really powerful tools for HIV prevention. However, even with adherence, still, there are some people that seem to fail PrEP. So we've been interested in trying to understand, is there a pharmacological basis or biological basis for why some people may not get the same activity from PrEP as other people? And specifically, can we try to understand that more and tailor the therapy um, depending on understanding someone's individual biology? So focusing in on tenofovir, what's interesting about these drugs, they are nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors um, of HIV. So essentially, 
They are administered as prodrugs, but even once they're converted to um, tenofovir, for instance, the drug itself, it's a prodrug in that it has to be phosphorylated by intracellular kinases to tenofovir monophosphate and subsequently to tenofovir diphosphate, which is the pharmacologically active form. So tenofovir itself does not have the activity we need. We must have this phosphorylation occur in order to get the pharmacological activity. So you need to form this tenofovir diphosphate in order to have the antiviral activity we're looking for. In this case, HIV prevention, even though this drug is also used for treatment. So when I started my lab, no one knew, we didn't know the identity of these kinases. We knew that they had to be phosphorylated, but we didn't know which kinases did it. And I thought that it was important to understand the identity of these kinases because there could potentially be differences between people that could lead to differences in our ability to activate these drugs. And we were doing clinical studies where we saw some differences in outcomes as far as the efficacy of PrEP. Certainly, much of this is due to adherence, but we think there also could be a role for biology. So one of the first things we did was set out to identify what exactly these kinases were and then try to discover whether there might be genetic variants of these kinases that could make them act differently in one person versus another. So as you know, there are many, many kinases and many kinases that can act on nucleotides. So in this case, tenofovir you know, looks a lot like AMP. So we did just some in silico screening to start thinking about which kinases could potentially phosphorylate tenofovir? So we got some candidates. We thought that an adenylate kinase or a guanylate kinase could potentially perform the first step, and that a creatine kinase or a pyruvate kinase, based on the structure of tenofovir monophosphate, could perform the second step that's absolutely required to pharmacologically activate tenofovir by forming the tenofovir diphosphate. So these were our candidates. So we wanted to do some experiments to try to figure out if these kinases indeed play a role in activating tenofovir. And if they do that in the cells and tissues where we need this to happen in order to prevent infection. So we did a small study involving healthy volunteers. And essentially what we did was isolate cells and tissues that are relevant and important for HIV um, transmission and infection. So we looked in peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So these are the blood cells that contain the CD4 positive T cells that are susceptible to HIV infection. We use colorectal tissue and vaginal tissue because these are tissues that represent routes of sexual transmission of HIV. We wanted to know in these cells and tissues that are putative sites of um, HIV infection, if these kinases were present and if they were responsible for activating tenofovir to the diphosphate. So at the time, we used sRNA to, in these cells and tissues, knock down these kinases individually. And this was actually some of the earliest work showing that you could apply this technique directly to tissue biopsies. We then administered tenofovir um, to these cells and tissues and then used mass spectrometry, which is really central to our lab, to try to see whether we could see the phosphorylated metabolites. So we're excited to see that when we looked in peripheral blood mononuclear cells, for instance, that we could see expression of um, adenylate kinase 2, guanylate kinase, as well as pyruvate kinases, mu muscle, and liver, and red blood cell. We also, with sRNA, were able to get effective knockdown. When we knocked, performed our knockdowns and then incubated with tenofovir, what we saw is that knockdown of adenylate kinase 2 substantially decreased formation to the tenofovir monophosphate. Knockdown of adenylate kinase 2 also meant we weren't getting tenofovir diphosphate. Makes sense, you need the monophosphate first. We knocked down the pyruvate kinases, we saw a decrease in the diphosphate formation. So we thought for the first time we actually had an indication of what the pathway of activation might specifically be in an important, clinically and biologically important cell. And this work was done by Julie Laid, who was a grad student in the lab. When we looked in vaginal tissue, we saw a similar result to, blood, to the peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Knockdown of adenylate kinase 2, decreased monophosphate formation. Knockdown of the pyruvate kinases led to a decrease in formation of that pharmacologically active metabolite. So that was interesting. However, when we looked at colorectal tissue, which is you know, another putative site of transmission of HIV infection, we saw a different pattern. And this was interesting to us because it suggested for the first time that there might be some tissue specificity in the activation of tenofovir. So it may not be that it's activated the same across the whole body. And this was really a new concept that we were raising. So when we looked here, we actually saw, yes, adenylate kinase 2 performing that first step. However, 
We did not see the pyruvate kinases expressed, but we did find a creatine kinase, creatine kinase muscle. And when we knocked down creatine kinase, we saw a substantial decrease in the formation of tenofovir diphosphate. So we think that we've worked out this pathway um, thus. So in PBMC and vaginal tissue, we think that adenylate kinase 2 performs the first step, and pyruvate kinase is the second step. In colonic tissue, we think that it's a little bit different. We still see adenylate kinase 2 performing that first step, however, creatine kinase with the ultimate step. So not only now are we armed with understanding of the kinases involved, but as I mentioned, we're starting to now think that there are more complex kinetics here and that we do need to think about tissue and cell specific differences in activation. So we wanted to get at our big picture question was, okay, you know, we know these kinases are involved. Are there differences between people then potentially in their ability to activate tenofovir based on genetics? So we've genotyped a few thousand people at this point, but I'm showing you data for about a thousand of these individuals. So we genotyped these folks for the genes that encode creatine kinase muscle, adenylate kinase 2, and the pyruvate kinases that we found activate tenofovir. We looked in various sites, so we looked in the United States, we genotyped people from South Africa, Uganda, and Thailand. And there's a lot here, so I'll walk you through what I think the important things are. The first thing is that for each of these um, kinases, so for instance, starting here with creatine kinase muscle, we see that there are variants. So not only did we detect variants in each site where we looked, but we also saw that there were people that carried more than one variant. In fact, in Uganda, we found that over 20% of people seem to carry one variant, more than one variant for um, these kinases. And this really held up across all of them. So not only did we discover new variants that had not been previously reported, no one's really looked at these kinases in this context and really thinking about you know, how they might work on drugs. So we discovered a lot of new variants, but in addition, we see that there's variability across geography as far as even the prevalence of kinases with um, the participants from Uganda consistently showing more variants and more variability. In the center, the Venn diagram is essentially only to say that there's overlap. So someone might have a variant of adenylate kinase and a creatine kinase. So it means that this becomes pretty complex in thinking about what the impact could be of genetic variation on activation. But with the idea that we have genetic variants of these kinases, we want to start really thinking about could this underlie some of the outcomes from these drugs. So bring you back to our model. The first step, adenylate kinase 2. We've actually seen that everywhere we've looked. For PBMC and vaginal tissue, pyruvate kinases, creatine kinase for colonic tissue. So Joseph Tillotson, who's a postdoc in the lab, took these variants that we discovered. We did some analysis in silico to, to determine which ones we thought could have an effect, could potentially have um, differential activity towards tenofovir compared to the wild type enzyme, he expressed and purified them in vitro to test that directly. And so what we're excited to find was that many of these variants that we discovered indeed did have an effect on decreasing formation of tenofovir monophosphate and diphosphate. And interestingly, there was one variant, a lysine 28 to arginine, that had a marked impact. So there's a variant at the same position, but it's a lysine 28 to glutamic acid that actually has a pretty strong clinical phenotype, where people that carry this have underdeveloped immune system. Basically, they have B cell deficiencies. And so we think there's a precedent where if someone with a variant at this position could have an effect that manifests itself as a clinical phenotype because they have differences in their formations of ADP and ATP, then the same principle certainly can be applied to a drug that requires these same pathways to be activated. So we're trying to start thinking about these enzymes kind of beyond learning about them in our basic biochemistry to really bringing them into the world of drug metabolizing enzymes. So we think that these kinases have variants that could change their activity. So we looked at some clinical samples, showing you data here from about 500 participants where we genotyped people for adenylate kinase specifically. We stratified them based on essentially whether they were wild type or didn't carry any variants that we found to have a deleterious effect or whether they carried a variant. So these people were all heterozygous. We didn't have any homozygous folks here. So on the one hand, the data are exciting and encouraging in that 
individuals who were carrying a variant found um, predicted to be deleterious, we see that they don't have tenofovir diphosphate in their blood cells. So if they're given tenofovir, we take their blood cells, we look for tenofovir diphosphate. We don't see that activated drug. So it looks like there is a difference in these people as far as activating tenofovir. However, what you'll see in the wild type group, right, there are lots of people too that don't have activated tenofovir diphosphate. So it turns out adherence was an issue here. Many of these people actually do not have detectable levels of tenofovir. So if we transform this data to normalize for tenofovir, we actually can see a more marked effect, but we just need more people in our variant group to power that more. But it's encouraging because it suggests to us that we were able to go from studies to really kind of start thinking about the kinases involved, some mechanistic work, to even something that it looks like we do have some hints for translation clinically. So to think about this kind of more complex picture, so I showed you adenine kinase 2 and we have these other kinases that are involved. We wanted to do similar analyses looking at some of these other kinases. So I'll show you some data we've looked at creatine kinase specifically. Colonic tissue is really an important route to think about because of potential transmission in men who have sex with men. So to really think about how we can fine tune and understand what exposure might be in that tissue specifically, we think that in addition to looking at adenylate kinase 2, we're really interested and it's important to think about variants in creatine kinase. So I'll show you those data. So we took a similar approach to what I showed you earlier, where essentially we expressed and purified variants that we discovered through our clinical study and looked at the ability of these enzymes to then activate tenofovir. So here we see that most of the enzymes, um, the mutants actually seem to have an effect, and there are several that are essentially loss of activity. So we're not seeing any activation of tenofovir with these variants. These R130H and 132C variants make sense. They're active site variants, but there are some, like this W211R, that's actually distant from the active site. So we're thinking more about the effect that these variants certainly could have, but certainly encouraging and really interesting to think about variants that we discovered in our clinical study could actually have an effect then on activation of this drug. So as I mentioned, most of what we know about these enzymes come from our basic biochemistry. We all probably you know, learned in a biochemistry class about creatine kinase and um, its role in um, energy balance. And so we started thinking about the fact that all of our predictions and really what we know about activity are due to its canonical kind of endogenous activity. So we wanted to know, okay, these mutants, we see the effect on tenofovir, how does that compare to what it does endogenously? So we did a side-to-side -side comparison looking at formation of tenofovir diphosphate and formation of ATP, which really represents the endogenous canonical activity. And you see these profiles are different. So it means that if we think about the fact, people will say, well, you know, these variants, if they had such a big effect, wouldn't we see more people walking around with, you know, a phenotype because their endogenous energy balance would be off. And so what we say is that these substrates are similar but a little bit different, and it looks like the enzymes, even these mutants, are able to phosphorylate um, ADP, for instance, much more readily than they can the tenofovir monophosphate to diphosphate. So it really underlies the idea that even if we know the um, endogenous activity of an enzyme, that there's importance in still understanding what it might do pharmacologically. And that even if we don't see people with these phenotypes just thinking about kind of their basic biology, that doesn't mean there might not be an effect when they're taking a drug that utilizes these pathways. So there are several creatine kinase enzymes. I was showing you creatine kinase muscle. And so we also wanted to look at some other creatine kinases that are important in other tissues. So we looked at CKB, which is creatine kinase brain. And essentially what we see is that it has similar activity as far as tenofovir activation as creatine kinase muscle. And interestingly, we see the same outcome here with this creatine kinase brain, that if we look at variants that impact formation of the tenofovir diphosphate, the effect is not as marked looking at ATP formation. So we really think there's precedent in understanding these enzymes more specifically from a drug metabolism perspective. So this kind of genetics understanding, we're starting to move toward looking at people specifically who fail PrEP and genotyping them to see whether they have some of these variants. 
And we do think that this genetic variation can end up being a key to really understanding someone's response and who is more likely to respond well versus another. At the same time, there are a number of variants that can have a marked effect on just protein expression, for instance. So I want to introduce you to some exciting proteomics approaches we're taking to try to start understanding that phenomenon. The other perspective that we're thinking about this from is Genotyping people can be difficult. Um, there are many parts of the world where we look to do these studies where, for instance, the government does not want to participate in um, their citizens being genotyped. There are places where they just don't want that to happen. Um, they have concerns about privacy and data, and you know that's understandable. So if we could develop an approach where we can microsample someone and just look at their protein expression, for instance, then it would give us a way, potentially, to phenotype them, to understand what their ability to activate these drugs might be without having to rely on genetics. So as part of this, we've been really trying to pioneer a single cell proteomics-based approach in our lab. So there are you know, a handful of labs in the world that can perform single cell proteomics. We're one of them, and I'll tell you about kind of our unique perspective on it that I think is um, useful and can translate potentially um, to clinical application. So first, some people ask, well, why do we need single cell proteomics? I do proteomics all the time at the core facility. I grind up my tissue. I grind up you know, um, my cells, and you know, I get this really interesting proteome information. So we think that's great, and we do bulk proteomics too. But we think that there are really gaps in knowledge about protein abundance, um, post-translational modification heterogeneity, how protein expression really aligns with um, you know, RNA, and so we're very interested in getting to a granular level. We can look at individual cells and understand their protein expression levels. So as I mentioned, single cell proteomics, we don't have many people taking this approach. However, with the increases in mass spec technology, it's become something that's possible in um, 2021. So last year, there were only three studies published that featured proteins from single cell human cells. This is really a nascent field. So there's really an opportunity to expand this. And one interest of my lab, as I mentioned, is how can we move this into a clinical setting? Many of the studies use a specific technology called an Orbitrap mass spectrometer. And the only reason I'm saying is because I'm going to differentiate kind of what we're doing that I think gives us some advantages. So most people are using one technology where you're kind of able to um, amplify your analytes of interest by trapping them, but we're taking a little bit of a different approach that gives us additional insight that you can't get with that approach. So what we're pioneering um, is a development of a method that's based on ion mobility, time of flight, mass spec. So essentially what this is, we have um, with mass spectrometry based proteomics, you'll take your analytes of interest, separate them with li li liquid chromatography um, based on their hydrophobicity. So we have an additional separation, ion mobility, that happens in the gas phase. So if we have all of our analytes of interest, so these could be peptides, we're doing proteomics, they can be separated in the gas phase. It gives us additional granularity where we can get more information about those peptides. With the technology we're using, we can you know, get our data so fast that we're um, you know, increasing our complexity, our complexity um, by a factor of 200 in a single second over other approaches. And we also can look at hundreds of peptide fragments per second. And so what we get when we do this is what you'd expect. You know, a mass spec chromatogram shows you just everything that came up. We can run um, about 300 cells in a day with 30 minute run times. And then we get our data, just like you normally would with your proteomics. We get our spectra, we match it up to a library, and that gives us identifications of proteins. So with our single cell mass spec approach, using this ion mobility enabled mass spectrometry, we're able to detect readily over 1,000, sometimes 1,500 proteins in individual in a single cell. And we also can detect post-translational modification. So this has been really exciting because we can look at modified proteins and try to understand how those modifications vary from cell to cell. So what does this mean in the context of our big question? It means that hopefully, if for instance, we're thinking about variants that change protein expression, that we can microsample people. We would only need you know, a small number of cells and to really perform this method and be able to see whether you know, this individual or another individual had lower levels of the proteins they need to activate tenofovir, as an example. 
also by just being able to understand modifications and just the overall kind of scope of their proteome, we're hopeful that we can apply that to just better understanding of the individual health of their cells and also, again, what their activity might be as far as, as, far as activating these drugs. So the way that we perform this experiment functionally then is that we have, say, cells in culture. We, um, so this could be our uh, colonic tissue cells, or this could be some other gastrointestinal cell or peripheral blood mononuclear cell, whatever cell we're interested in. We have them in culture. We sort them. And then we end up with a 96-well plate that has one cell dropped into each well, essentially. We use a tandem mass tag, which is a chemical labeling approach, essentially, where we can apply a label to you know, each individual cell. And this allows us to multiplex. So now we can run in one run many cells together that have their, these individual tags so we understand you know, which um, kind of cell each of the data are coming from. And so we then can run this on our mass spec and through our proteomic software and get detection of proteins at the individual cell level. So we've done this in gastrointestinal cells to look at activation of tenofovir, at least the kinases involved in activation. So this is just looking at a small number of cells. But one thing that I wanted to show you here is we see heterogeneity. So this is in a pooled, so this is from 10 individuals, their cells all pooled. But there's a wide range, as you can see, in the levels we're seeing of abundance of these kinases. So this means there really is something to understand about potential differences in the levels of these kinases, how well we each may be able to activate these drugs. Now, some of it may be tolerated. Some level of difference may still be fine pharmacologically. But there certainly is a threshold we're having a difference. We're going to see something um, that has an effect and could actually lead to um, failure, for instance, of uh, PrEP or the treatment. So we're applying this approach more broadly now. We're getting samples from more people to really try to understand at the individual cellular level what is the range of the level of these kinases, their expression, but also can we use this as a clinical approach where we can microsample, as I mentioned, only requiring a small number of cells instead of a million, which is what you would most often use now really to look at levels within cells to try to understand for a given individual what their um, expression and activity might be. So that's where we are with that. And I just wanted to talk to you now about how we're thinking about personalization and genetics on the flip side of things. So I told you drug metabolism is really key in regulating levels of a drug that end up making it into our bloodstream. And so we just looked at a story where the metabolism leads to activation and we need the metabolism. However, I also mentioned there are times when the, metabolite can lead, the metabolism can lead to the formation of a metabolite that's toxic and where that can lead to organ failure. For instance, if you think about acetaminophen, which is the active ingredient in Tylenol and in many other drugs, you probably know that it's very toxic to liver, and that's because there's a metabolite formed by the cytochromes P450 that's very toxic and starts killing liver cells, essentially. You're not supposed to drink alcohol and take Tylenol because the levels of the P450 that make that toxic metabolite are increased with alcohol, for instance. So really think about that concept. We've wanted to know HIV drugs that are toxic, specifically liver toxic, does drug metabolism play a role in that? So I'll tell you a story um, where we've been doing that analysis. So for this work, I'm gonna talk to you about an older HIV drug that we've worked on, even though we're applying this approach to newer drugs as well. But the good thing about working on an older drug is that we can get plenty of clinical samples and it's understood really well clinically and we can establish our mechanisms that hopefully can be translated. So this story is focused on a drug called efavirenz. So it's been used in HIV treatment since the late 90s. It's a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor used to um, treat HIV-1. It's considered an essential medicine by the World Health Organization. However, it has adverse events, including hepatotoxicity and neurotoxicity. So up to 10% of people get hepatotoxicity, so liver toxicity, to a level that they have to stop taking efavirenz. The mechanism's unknown. Also, there's neurotoxicity, where up to 40% of people get neurotoxicity that leads to them um, having to stop taking efavirenz. So we wanted to understand what the mechanisms underlying that might be so we can potentially predict people more likely to have that toxicity. What's interesting to us from a drug metabolism standpoint is that it's extensively metabolized. So 
What was known when we started this project was that a Favrins was metabolized by a couple of different P450s. So I showed you on the other side, I said P450. So these CYP, CYP, those are just different cytochromes P450. We have 57 genes in our bodies for P450s. This is a subset and they're involved in a Favrins metabolism. So a Favrins is primarily metabolized by a P450 called cytochrome P452B6 to 8-hydroxyafavrins, so there's oxygen inserted at this 8 position, and it can be metabolized again by 2B6 to 8-14-hydroxyafavrins. It can also be metabolized by 2A6 to 7-hydroxyafavrins. What's really interesting about afavrins is that it's an auto-inducer of its own metabolism, which means that it increases its own metabolism. So as you take it over time, you end up with more and more of the metabolite formation. Just like I talked about, alcohol can induce that P450 that metabolizes Tylenol. Afavarins induces the P450s that metabolize it. So it induces expression of 2B6 through nuclear receptor activation. So what you find over time is that people that have been taking afavarins for a long time actually will have higher levels of the primary metabolite, 8 hydroxyafavarins circulating in their blood than afavarins itself. So when we started this work, we said, okay, we don't need to know the mechanism of toxicity. Can we figure it out? Can we try to use that information to predict who's likely to get toxicity? In addition, can we start thinking about a role for metabolites in that toxicity since we know oftentimes there are metabolites involved? So, the first thing we did was make sure that we fully understood the metabolism scheme for efavirin. So one of our earlier studies was actually to expand from what I showed you, which was this 2A6 forms 7-hydroxy, 2B6 forms 8-hydroxy, 814, to adding two additional metabolites. So we performed a clinical study, people were dosed efavirins, we collected many different body fluids from those people, and we actually were able to find two previously undescribed metabolites of efavirins, a 7-8 dihydroxy efavirins that was formed from the 8, and then a second P450 comes in and makes um, and performs the hydroxylation at the 7 position. And we also found a second dihydroxylated metabolite, but we weren't able to definitively identify what it was. So we know that it's hydroxylated at the eight position. However, we couldn't identify exactly where on the cyclopropyl ring that second dihydroxylation occurred. But really armed with the knowledge now of what we think is the full metabolism scheme of efavirins, we started to perform studies to see whether efavirins was cytotoxic or toxic to liver cells in an in vitro assay, and also whether the metabolites played a role. So when we did that work, we found indeed, not only could efavirins kill liver cells in our in vitro systems of primary human um, liver cells, primary human hepatocytes, but also that 8 hydroxy efavirins was very potent at killing those cells. So we started to try to think about mechanism so that we can understand who might be more likely to get this toxicity. So in thinking about mechanism, we looked at many different cellular signaling pathways that could be involved as far as regulation of stress and regulation of cell death and survival. And so one of the pathways that we found um, that we believe is centrally involved in the cell death or um, liver function, liver um, toxicity from efavirins and 8 hydroxyafavirins is the inositol requiring 1-alpha pathway or IR1-alpha. So essentially, this is an arm of the ER stress pathway. IRO1-alpha normally, when everything's cool in the cell, is bound to BIP, a chaperone protein. Under stress, BIP leaves. IRO1-alpha um, is able to homodimerize. It attracts a protein called TRAF2, which then goes on to activate apoptosis signaling kinase 1 and c internal kinase. This has been found previously in other contexts to lead to cell death. So apoptosis, cell death in liver cells. For instance, with um, liver transplant, ischemia reperfusion injury, this pathway plays a role in the cell death you see from liver cells. Interestingly, IR1-alpha has kinase activity and endoribonuclease activity. So it also, once activated, can cleave XBP1, Xbox binding protein 1, mRNA. And this is actually a way to really measure IR1-alpha activation, looking at spliced XBP1 versus unspliced. Activated or spliced XPP1 regulates the expression of many chaperones that play a role in cell survival. So we wanted to know, was this pathway potentially involved in liver toxicity from efavirins? So we started by looking at c and terminal kinase, since this has been specifically been shown to be involved in other instances of liver organ failure. So we use a mouse model, a junk or c and terminal kinase null mouse. 
And so we use these mice. They do not express one isoform of junk called junk one. And um, we treated them in this case with, I'm showing you data from the metabolite, 8-hydroxyafavirins, even though we've done this with afavirins itself. And so what we we're really excited to see was that if we dose the mice with 8-hydroxyafavirins, we see alanine transaminase levels up. So that's a marker for liver injury. So we see that increased and elevated that is commensurate with liver injury in these animals and even in humans. That was done in wild-type mice on a black 6J background. When we treated these same, when we treated junk null mice with the same 8-hydroxyafavirins dose, we didn't see the liver toxicity. So that's exciting because in these mice that don't have junk one, we're actually not seeing the liver toxicity. We looked at survival. If we give a really high dose of 8-hydroxyafavirins, we actually see that the mice that don't have um, junk one survive and the wild type mice die. We're not sure exactly why they die. Maybe sepsis, we're working that out, but the mice die. You can see that their liver um, is uh, really not in good shape. There's a lot of toxicity. When we do the histology, we see lots of liver damage to the wild type mice, and however, the null mice have healthy livers. So this was really the first time that anyone was able to show a potential mechanism of a favarin's induced toxicity. And so we're really enthusiastic that it looks like junk actually is a central molecule to this signaling. So since we saw activation of, since we saw that junk seemed to be involved in the cell death, and we did other studies to show that junk was actually activated following treatment with favarins and 8-hydroxyafavirins, we went upstream to see whether IR1 alpha was activated by these drugs and whether inhibiting it could prevent the cell death to hepatocytes. So as I mentioned, a real hallmark way to look at IR1 alpha activity is to look at splicing of XBP1. So that's what we did. So we're using um, liver cells, hepatocytes from both mice and humans. So here in A, showing you humans, and here mice. So these human liver cells come from non-living donors. So these are people that have died, their livers are non-transplantable, but we're able to get cells from their liver to do these experiments. And so I'll kind of just walk you through this a little bit. So we have just a vehicle treatment, and we see we don't see activation of XBP1. So we're not seeing that activation of IR1-alpha and XBP1 splicing. We use tunicomycin, which is a positive control. It's kind of a prototypic activator of IR1-alpha. We indeed, we see splicing. We're looking at ratio of splice to unsplice. So when we see this lower band, that's splice, that's activated. Unactivated is the top band. So we're seeing activation as we'd expect the positive control. When we treat these hepatocytes with 50 micromolar favorins, which is actually the concentration that's most linked to toxicity in people, so it's a concentration that is observed clinically, we see activation of IR1-alpha. Similarly, the metabolite, 8 hydroxyafavirins we see this activation. So we see this in human hepatocytes. We're able to recapitulate it in mouse hepatocytes. So now we think we've got junk activation, and we even upstream of junk can see that activation. We did a test to determine whether we could knock down or um, inhibit IR1-alpha and get protection from the hepatocyte death. And so these are data from an experiment where we use athidium bromide acridine orange staining. And essentially, we look at green, so vehicle treated, negative control, these are healthy cells. When you see orange, red, sorry about that, those are dead and dying cells. So we're treating here with a favorins. You see the cells are dead and dying. We use styrosporine, which is a positive control. It's a prototypic inducer of um, cell death, and we see our dead and dying cells. When we use STF083010, which is an IRE1-alpha inhibitor, we see that we can rescue that effect. So just from the picture, when we're using a favorins with the inhibitor, the cells look now more green. They're not in that same dead and dying phase. And in fact, when we do the quantitation, that bears out and we can see that. So if you look at the number of apoptotic cells with a favorins elevated, decreased using the inhibitor of IR1-alpha. So we're very enthusiastic that we think we started to really work out this pathway, IR1-alpha activation and junk. And this was really, as I mentioned, the first time, the first indication of what a mechanism might be for this clinically important toxicity. We wanted to know what about the efavirin structure might make it an activator of IR1-alpha since it doesn't look like other activators defined in the literature. There is an interest in IR1-alpha activators also in cancer, for instance, and even arthritis. So we wanted to think about also, what is it about the structure of favorins that leads to activation of IR1-alpha? Can we learn something even more basic about the function of IR1-alpha? 
So we designed a panel of Favarin's analogs. I'm just showing you here a subset, we have more. But essentially, here's a Favarin's itself. We made changes to the structure. We've opened up the oxazinone ring. We've opened up the cyclopropyl group. We've made um, a bulkier, larger molecule, and then performed studies to test for iron-1-alpha activation to see if there's a role there, um, if what about this scaffold structure might lead to activation of iron-1-alpha. So we did this work. So these are in um, hepatocytes again, and we're looking at this splicing of XBP1. So the lower band is the activated, we have our control. So what's interesting here is that essentially all of these analogs led to activation. So there's definitely something about this structure that leads to um, activation of iron-1 alpha. So we're further working on fine tuning this as um, potentially chemotherapeutic. So to kind of deliberately activate iron-1 alpha and cause apoptosis in cells where you'd like to cause apoptosis. So hopefully at some time I can talk to you about that work, but we've really leveraged this to move toward even kind of a drug discovery approach with this. So in getting to our personalization, how do we use this? Well, a couple of things we're thinking about. One, since we've seen that 8-hydroxyafavirenz, that primary metabolite, really does seem to play a role in the toxicity, we're thinking about genotype. So how does genotype of the P450 that makes that metabolite, 2B6, how does that correlate with um, toxicity both to liver and to brain? But we also had an idea, if iron-1-alpha really plays a role, what if there are genetic differences in iron-1-alpha that could lead to someone being more likely, for instance, to have iron-1-alpha activated or even hyperactivation that could lead to toxicity? It's not something that's really been thought about. The signaling pathways involved in toxicity, we really don't think about that the fact that they could be genetically variable in and of themselves. So we looked at data for um, about 1,200 genotype people that were taking efavirenz, and we had understanding of whether they had hepatotoxicity or not. And essentially, um, there are a few things here that I think are exciting. So in this population, we were able to find some variants of IR1-alpha that led to amino acid substitution shown here. And these actually had some prevalence in people in our overall efavirenz treatment group. So you'll see we had you know, about 1.4% frequency, 2.7, 1.8 for these various variants. Interestingly, when we look specifically at people that had moderate to severe or severe um, efavirenz induced hepatotoxicity, these um, variants are kind of disproportionately present in that group. So three out of 17 people um, that had moderate to severe had um, this variant, this T410 to G. And similarly, we saw even one um, with a variant that was a lot rarer in the total population. So we think now we have another dimension to really think about HIV drugs and drugs in general and who they might work well for, even from a toxicity standpoint, by thinking more about genetics in the context of the targets, the things involved in that toxicity. So we're working to expand this and look at more um, patients. And in addition, we've been able to expand this to other drugs and recapitulate this in some of the newer drugs. To bring in kind of our single cell proteomics approach, I just wanted to show you what we're doing there to also think in a more unbiased way about what pathways could be involved. So if we're looking at drugs that induce liver failure like efavirenz, we also um, are performing studies with nevirapine, which is another um, antiretroviral drug in the same class. It's um, been more used to prevent mother to child transmission. And good old acetaminophen I told you about, it's just so toxic. So it's a good thing to kind of use as a control in thinking about the pathways involved. So we're tr treating hepatocytes with these drugs. We're performing our proteomic studies to try to really step back and think about what are all the potential variations that these drugs could cause on their way to being toxic, and how can we leverage that to really predict which patients are more likely to get toxicity versus others. So when we treat hepatocytes with these drugs, the first thing that we do is what many of us would do, and I talked about bulk proteomics, where we can take a whole liver tissue or a whole you know, culture and really look at what are the impacts we see on the proteome. So the only thing to take away from here is that we see some commonalities. So we look at these three hepatotoxic drugs, nevirapine, efavirenz, acetaminophen, at their IC50 values and IC90s. We see some similarities in the proteins that they impact and the increases in abundance of these proteins that we're seeing. So we think more broadly there might be some pathways here that we can start to think about even as biomarkers of drugs that might be toxic. 
If we take one of these proteins, for instance, um, like calnexin, a chaperone protein, and look at the individual cell level, looking in pooled individuals, so this is again our kind of 10-person pool, we see that there's a lot of variability cell to cell in the abundance of this um, chaperone protein. But there are a couple of things here that we think are exciting. One, these proteins that we're seeing impacted by these toxic drugs that we can see in our bulk proteomics, we can see it also at the individual cell level. So it means we can really start to think about mechanism at the level of the individual cell, which is incredible. Also, by understanding the heterogeneity in individual people and even in the population, we think using this individual, um, this single cell proteomics approach, I think we can gain a better understanding of how to predict toxicity from a drug in development and also toxicity from a drug that would be used therapeutically. So we do see that the trends in bulk proteomics hold up with our um, more toxic treatments of efavirenz, nevirapine, and um, acetaminophen. We do see statistically significant differences compared to control um, as far as the abundance of this protein. However, what I think is exciting here is really understanding this heterogeneity. Right now, we're looking at a pool of 10 people. If we look individually, can we see a correlation between toxicity and someone's individual cell level of this protein? And then could we use it as a way, as I mentioned, to clinically microsample and really personalize that treatment for you? And I just want to wrap up and kind of show you one other way that we're thinking about this, um, just where we're moving forward. So I mentioned to you that when we're thinking about a Favrin's toxicity and also certain other HIV drugs, we have this liver toxicity, but we also have brain tox toxicity. And that can be really debilitating for people. And so we're trying to understand those mechanisms more so that we can try to mitigate that and figure out are there other things that can be co-administered, um, there's certain people more susceptible. So we're using a mass spectrometry-based imaging approach to really understand um, how these drugs can affect tissues of interest. So here we're using what's called matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization mass spec. So essentially what we do is we can get a biopsy from a person or we can slice an organ from um, an animal and we put it on a slide that looks a lot like a microscope slide that you would use. We spray an organic matrix. So with this kind of mass spec, an organic matrix just helps with the ability to detect all of the compounds in that tissue, all of the analytes of interest. When we then put this in the instrument, there's a laser that moves across the tissue at um, step sizes that we set. So we can say, you know, every 20 microns, the laser will move. When the laser hits that spot, it takes a mass spectra. So you end up with, you know, lots of peaks everywhere. But we can then deconvolute that into essentially a heat map that gives us an image of our tissue of interest. So we can use this to understand where drugs are, where metabolites are and also to understand mechanisms by looking at the effect on kind of the endogenous metabolites and lipids and um, things that are important to homeostasis. So we do this, for instance, looking at efavirenz and also tenofovir and emtricitabine. Um, we can look in liver, for instance, and one reason that we were interested in doing this was we wanted to know whether efavirenz, since it's so toxic to liver, if it perhaps disproportionately accumulates in liver compared to other drugs. So what we saw, in fact, that pound for pound it does. So if we give an animal, so this is a mouse, um, tenofovir, emtricitabines, so remember those from the first story, and efavirenz, they're all normally um, prescribed together. We actually do see that efavirenz, so this dot is everywhere it was detected, we see efavirenz really um, in liver more so than these other drugs that are not liver toxic. So we think this could even be a screening method in drug development to understand toxicity profiles potentially by using animals and just understanding where drugs distribute. This is a label-free approach, so you don't need a fluorescent tag or anything like that. This is label-free. You're using the mass of your compound, basically, of your drug, and you're able to image. It's the only approach you can use for that. And this is just our histology um, up here, and these are just endogenous lipids. It's positive controls. So the way we're thinking about this for potential mechanism of impact is even looking at these organs that are affected by these drugs, how are kind of the endogenous uh, metabolites and lipids that are involved in just the regular um, uh, homeostasis of that organ and kind of the regular function of that organ, how are they potentially impacted? 
So we are able to image, for instance, here, these are phosphatidylcholines. We're looking in mouse brain. And as you'll see, with very similar phosphatidylcholines, we can get very specific patterns of distribution. So there's a couple of things about this that I think are powerful. One, most of what we know about endogenous metabolites and lipid are from kind of ground up tissue. So we know, okay, yes, it's there in brain, but we don't know where. This is telling us exactly where these things are present. And we can see with great specificity where they are. It's a hippocampus, for instance. Where is it? In addition, you'll see that they're all different. So if we were using most traditional approaches, you would just say they're all in brain, they're present. But it actually turns out that they have their own specific patterns of distribution. So we can do this in one run. We can look at you know, thousands of things at once. I'm just showing you a snapshot. But with this, then looking at our treatments and trying to understand toxicity, we can use this label-free imaging approach to really understand how the distribution spatially might change of some of these molecules and how that could underlie toxicity. And just to expand this, so we're doing it with phosphatidylcholines, we can look at pretty much anything, any lipid, any endogenous metabolite, we also look at proteins. So we're looking at sphingomyelins, we're looking at phosphatidic acids, and again, we're seeing this really specific distribution. And we think that this is a tool that we can start to use to understand how distribution might change. And by understanding the lipids that are important in that context, we do hope that we can move toward this predictability of toxicity. So that's what I wanted to share with you and where we're at. So I said toward personalization because I think that we're getting there. When we started this, there really wasn't much focus or thought on which enzymes are involved in each step. I think that we've opened that up and there are even more gro groups working on it now. And that with the clinical um, studies we have planned and ongoing, that we certainly are going to make lots of inroads on getting to a point in the next couple of years where we can genotype someone or even perform um, some of this microsampling we're talking about with proteomics to understand um, you know, what their potential outcomes might be based on their ability to process these drugs. I just want to thank the folks in my group. I tried to um, mention them as we went, um, grad students and postdocs, and also very grateful to NIH, who's been my funding. So NIGMS has been hanging with me for over a decade. It's my first funding and my primary funder, and also I'm really excited to now be part of the um, NIA family, and we're doing studies looking at these kinases specifically and how aging affects them, um, and hopefully I can talk to you about that one day. But thank you very much. Are there any uh, questions from the audience? Michael, do you have one? Or? I do. <laughs> Maybe use the mic so people uh, playing at home can yeah. uh, follow along. So um, clearly it's been a holy grail for pharmacologists and therapists and physicians to be able to do exactly what you described, which is to predict for an individual patient um, what the optimal dose is of a drug, whether some drugs are going to be more toxic than others and so on and so forth. And, You've done a beautiful job of outlining approaches that I think will get us in that direction. It's been amazing how long it's taken to get here. Yes. Uh, people mm -hmm. have been writing about this for years, but not many have been doing much yes. about it. So <laughs> I just wanted to say it's really wonderful to hear your comments. Um, I had a, uh, you, you referred to this a little bit, but a more general question. I mean, um, I was going to ask why the liver, and obviously you've shown in some cases that drugs like efavirenz will accumulate in the liver. But um, you would predict if it's genetic that you would see toxicity to other tissues as well. Mm -hmm. Do you? And if not, why not? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are other tissues that show toxicities. Um, and like I said, with the favorins, you have brain as well. And even with tenofovir, you know, a lot of the toxicity is renal. But I do think, for, at least for our imaging data, it seems to be that it really does parallel where these drugs seem to accumulate. And some of that may be due to transport and kind of you know something we need to start thinking about there. We don't know, no one knows what drives drug distribution really you know, beyond kind of some of the rules about lipophilicity. So I'm hopeful that having this imaging approach as a screen, we can start to understand which types of drugs seem to go where and predict based upon that. Um, there may be, you know, also toxicity to other tissues if the levels are, you know, lower, basically, of the drug getting there. They may just be harder to kind of pick up and to see um, sometimes, too. So I do think that some of it, a lot of it actually does correlate with abundance of the drug in, in a particular organ. So, um, 
Um, there is a lot of interest in, in developing tissues on a chip to do some of these toxicity studies. Have you had any experience with that? And presumably it would have to be, each individual would have to provide their own chip because this is obviously a very personal response to drugs. Yep. So um, tissues on a chip, I think, are exciting. It's something that we've been, you know, kind of starting to dabble in and think about. I think that some more progress needs to be made. We see that there are, you know, loss of expression of some of the things we're looking at, you know, some more optimization around the tissues on the chip. Um, but I think it's a really promising area, and it certainly is the next frontier. Okay. I do have a couple questions from uh, online. Uh, one is from uh, one of our NIAD PIs, uh, Stefan Molio. Um, in cancers, PKM is alternatively spiced, spliced. Would you know if both PKM1 and PKM2 can phosphorylate tenofovir uh, to the same extent? That's a great question. Um, it's something that we're looking at. Our preliminary data suggests yes, um, but we have more to do there. But preliminarily, it looks like yes, but um, more to do. Great question. Hi, I'm Jennifer Webster Syriac from NIDCR. Great talk, I loved it. Uh, and I have a few questions. One is whether the drug can actually be modified at the binding site or to modify the conformation of the drug so that the endogenous kinases may be more effective um, in your tenofovir story. Yes, I think that there, with knowing more, there certainly probably are ways to start doing some kind of rational drug design mm -hmm. from that perspective and changing some of the structures. Yeah, I think that that's certainly something um, to, to do and to think about. Okay. Another question is, there are microbial kinases mm -hmm. for some viruses and bacteria. Is there the potential that, um, is there a role for the microbiome in terms of what's happening there? Yes. So there has been a lab that has published that they can see phosphorylation by microbes. So I think there is participation there probably, especially when we're talking about you know, vaginal tissue, colonic tissue, mm -hmm. um, certainly. Okay. And the last one is a plug for the oral cavity because the colonic tissue, the vaginal tissue actually looks a lot like the mucosal tissue mm -hmm. in the oral cavity and with the same similar complement of immune cells. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just wondered if you tested there because I know that you can actually detect these metabolites in saliva. Mm -hmm. So as you move towards personalization, that's certainly an easier thing yep. for the patient to provide a little saliva. I agree. And we're um, working on assays for detection and analyses of um, these you know, proteins in saliva, yes. Okay, maybe one more online, if you don't mind. OK, this one was also uh, from one of our PIs, a clinician, Sadana Jackson. Uh, can you comment on uh, variability of drug metabolism as it relates to treatment resistance over time. For example, what about cancer treatment resistance with drug metabolism of chemotherapy? I think that is a spectacular point and not enough done on that. We really haven't had that focus and it's not something that um, people are doing a lot of work on. I think more of the resistance work has been around kind of drug transport, but certainly um, I think that there is a chance that people with you know, certain variants maybe that are ultra metabolizers of a drug, so they're now lower levels of that drug around, are more likely to get resistance, for instance. So I think that that is a really important thing to look at. We are planning a study um, to start looking at using our single cell proteomics approach, how the proteome is different in resi certain resistant tumor cells versus non-resistant. So I think there's a lot to do there, and we're really excited about that. It's a great question. Close out, Dr. Gottesman, yeah. if you like. So, well, let me thank you for an extraordinary, uh, beautiful lecture and <laughs> an opportunity to bring at least some of us together in the same room. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay at the NIH. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening.